Welcome everybody to the ESRC Centre for Population Change and Connecting Generations seminar, which today is jointly hosted with the Centre for Research on Ageing and the Department of Gerontology. I'm delighted to introduce Clara Raber, who is a visiting postgraduate student in the Department of Gerontology and also in CPCCG. Clara is in her third year of her doctoral programme in the Department of Sociology, Radboud University, Faculty of Social Sciences, Nijmegen, Netherlands. Clara's PhD thesis focuses on the long-term employment consequences of informal caregiving from a life course perspective. Um, we are really lucky to have had the opportunity to host Clara with us um, for the last 12 weeks, well, actually 10 weeks. And this is, was a period of time <coughs> where Clara was able to work on the issue of unpaid caregiving and job satisfaction in the UK with uh, Professor Jane Falkingham and myself. And we're delighted that she has the opportunity to share her results with you today and receive some feedback. Um, we will take questions and comments at the end of the seminar, and I'd just like to remind everybody to mute the microphone. Okay, over to you, Clara. Thank you very much, Maria. I am sharing my screen, this weird moment where you also have to talk and say you're sharing your screen. I don't see my mouse anymore, but here it is. Now you should see my slides and they are moving. Perfect. Um, thanks again and hello everyone. And I first of all want to thank for the invitation uh, from Maria and Shane to the seminar. It's really a pleasure. And uh, Maria already told you basically everything that I want to say in my first slide, but I will con completely say it again. And um, normally you would find me at the Radboud University in Nijmegen, which is in the Netherlands. And I work with these two people with Ellen Verbake and Mark Fisser. But currently I'm also sitting right now in the, at the University of Southampton and the Center for Population Change, the Department of Gerontology and Connecting Generations. Um, I'm working with Maria Ivanto and Jane Fockingham. And this couldn't be possible without the European Consortium of Sociological Research, who is finding this, uh, funding this research stay. So what I want to do today, a bit about my outline, is to give you first like the big puzzle. Why am I doing this research on employment consequences of unpaid caregiving? With unpaid caregiving, sometimes I will name it informal caregiving. I mean basically taking care of someone in your own network that has health issues and needs care for that. So it is really about the own social network and like helping someone that is sick or disabled, um, like friends, family, or neighbors. So it is really like in within the own network. So I will give you the puzzle why I'm finding this very interesting and why I'm doing my complete dissertation on this. And I will give you also an overview about two theories that come again and again in all my research back and will also later in the job satisfaction part come back as well. And I also want to give you uh, a short overview of what we already know about employment consequences, both from my own research, but also um, from um, um, also from literature in general, which is nicely overlapping with what I'm finding. And then I will really zoom in on the study I'm doing with Maria and Shane on job satisfaction. And so about my puzzle, it is really about, or the starting point is that we have aging populations, more and more people are getting older and less people are young. So there is a disbalance that wasn't there before. And you have like these two sides. So on the one side, you have the caregiving side, and on the other side, you have the employment side. And uh, both are influenced by these aging societies. So on the caregiving side, this means more people are old or have older age, uh, which also means that more and more people need care. Um, what is going on right now also from the government side is that more and more people should take care in their own network. So less formal care is available and it is really put on people in their own network to provide care. So we have more people that need care and also more people that need to provide care for their relatives or friends. 
On the employment side, this also means we have less people that are at working age or are have the capacity to work. So um, there are also less people, but on the other side, there's also like we have more people that need to get pensions and we also need more welfare contributions to also um, cover all these care related costs that are coming. And there's like the idea that these two are influencing each other and um, more in the sense of that caregiving is influencing employment and makes it more difficult because you have to care for someone makes it maybe difficult um, to also work. So in SCOOP terms, uh, which I didn't introduce yet, um, SCOOP is like my graduate program or one of my graduate programs and it's about sustainable cooperation where we are discussing how can society be sustainable, how, but in this sense, what you're seeing here, it seems not to be very sustainable with more people that need care and give care and have to work at the same time. So it is a kind of downward spiral or vicious cycle going on. And if this is the case, um, this is something we really have to tackle very early, I would say. So um, what I want to do in my research, or I'm doing already, I'm going closer to the end, is really to understand, okay, what are the employment consequences of unpaid care? I also, in some of my papers, try to focus also on what is driving these consequences. But for today, I really wanna focus on what are the employment consequences. And I'm always taking like this life course perspective uh, because I see care as something that is not only happening once in a lifetime, but for multiple times, like in this picture here, you care for your grandma, when you're younger, then the, your partner might get sick, so you care again, and then the partner may be something longer, while for your grandma, you might be helping her after her operation or something. So it is not this, it's not a one-time event, it's something that is really spanning over the life course and kept, can happen in different stages. Um, so what I try to do in all of my research is to include at least some life course perspective, and sometimes it's only by including time, um, which is also, of course, important for selection effect because we have certain types of people that are the ones taking care of people in their network. Like, for instance, women are the ones more often taking care. Um, but also we know that uh, labor market attachment is um, also a telling so if people are uh, selecting themselves into caregiving. For instance, if you don't work that much, you're more likely to care for someone. So from these two theories that we have, the first one is role conflict theory. And it's basically the idea that you have many roles in your life. For instance, you have your working role. And I mean, uh, probably everyone can relate uh, because we have a lot on our plates. We have to also figure out what to eat in the evening, hopefully healthy eating, have to clean our apartment, maybe do some sports or go out with friends, have a hobby. And then is there's childcare for many people as well. And so I'm taking here the metaphor of the full blade. Um, I find it already sometimes very difficult to juggle friends, job and eating healthy. Um, but uh, when you care, more gets on your plate. So it, it gets even more complicated to combine all these roles. So um, the idea of the role conflict theory is basically that you have less resources available if you're having these multiple roles such as less time, less energy, and also less financial resources. And there seems to be a conflict between work and care. But there's also these, this other theory that's more positive. the it's enrichment theory that says, okay, you have these two roles, but they don't have to be that negative to each other. They can also complement each other because you can also learn something from the caregiving, like time management. And it can be also a role that might be more a respite for you, where you can be like, okay, caregiving is stressful, but now I'm going to work and I have something really cool. I, I'm working on my really cool research paper where I feel I can contribute more. So it can be a way out as well. Um, when we look at what we already know, um, what we kind of find or what is something that is relatively known in the literature and I also replicated in the German context is that caregivers do reduce labor supply when caregiving. So they reduce their working hours 
and they stop to care. Uh, in another paper on the Dutch context, we also see that caregivers are um, changing their jobs or become self-employed because of caregiving. Um, but this is uh, to a lesser extent. So in the Dutch research, we find that reducing working hours is the most prominent and, um, and changing job or becoming self-employed is in very little cases happening. Also, we know um, that from this paper, um, from the strategy paper, is that um, care, these decisions to adapt work for care are driven by a role conflict. So we were looking into how many tasks you have, uh, what kind of intensity in, in the sense of how many hours you are um, caring for someone. But also if you really have like issues combining work and care and we see this is really driving caregivers to adapt their work. In another paper, we look at the wage penalty for informal caregiving and see, okay, there is really a wage penalty going on. So caregivers on average earn less compared to similar non-caregivers. What we did there is we compared very similar caregivers to people that never cared in their life uh, and matched them with like same age, same sex, um, if they have children, the same education, and if they have a partner. So really looking directly and what is going on there. And what we see there is also something positive going on. So what we found in this paper is the longer you care, the, the smaller gets the wage penalty for caregiving. So we were then thinking, is this a hint of enrichment going on there? Or is it maybe only survival bias? So only those that are doing, like are able to stay in the labor market are the ones that are later on also um, like um, able to get back some of the lost um, wage penalty. So we also find this in a paper that I'm right now working on uh, where I do wage curves. So really comparing after caregiving started if caregivers earn less compared to similar uh, to non-caregivers. Uh, also, we see there for women this positive thing going on. So um, to put it together, we find mostly negative, um, like a negative kind of um, effect going on, which kind of always gives us the hint that role conflict theory is the one uh, mostly driving um, this spillover between caregiving and employment. But then um, this, I actually took a very positive picture of my supervisor, Martin van Hees. He's a, a philosopher, a moral philosopher in Amsterdam at the Freie University. And uh, because in the school program, we are interdisciplinary and you have a supervisor from another field. And he was like, but that can't just be it. Um, because you care, in this sense, you care in the sense of you value your family there's something positive going on, you are helping someone that is sick. So maybe it's not that bad for the overall well-being of a person to reduce labor supply, stop working, change job. Maybe it's something positive. They are at the end more happy. So um, we were discussing, okay, maybe we're looking at the wrong thing or more the inappropriate thing when we really want to see something positive. So we came up with the idea so if we want to see something positive going on, we have to also look at something well-being related. Um, so that's how I came up with the idea with job satisfaction. And I went with this idea to Maria and Jane and we developed the following research. So now comes the absolutely new part and uh, write down all your thoughts because you're helping us very much if you give comments on this part. I will just... Take a sip of water. So why should we look at job satisfaction? Of course, now I explained it hopefully well, that it should provide us a, a full picture um, with this well-being component. So if we really want to understand the employment consequences in full, it's important to also look at the job satisfaction. But also, uh, mostly in business or organizational theory or research, it is done quite often to look at job satisfaction. Um, and it's argued um, because people tend to spend a lot of time at work. It is also important that people are happy at work or satisfied 
And uh, work is also something uh, important for a person's own identity. So if you ask someone, what are you doing in your life? Uh, mostly people will answer with the job they're having. So it is really important for everyone or most people um, to have this work identity. And it's also important for performance of organizations. That's something I'm always not uh, that convinced by, but uh, if it's a good organization, I would say it's also good if people are happy in it. So um, that's something to consider as well. And by that, we wanna uh, answer the research question, to what extent is unpaid caregiving related to changes in job satisfaction? And you already see it's really about the changes in job satisfaction and how this is related to unpaid caregiving. And it's really overall. So we don't really focus on what is the mechanism behind, um, but really like we want to see, is there what is going on? Is it higher or lower the job satisfaction after you started caregiving? And we look at this from two kind of caregiving perspectives. The one is that we look at caregiving intensity, meaning for how many hours you are caregiving and the duration in a sense of are you a newly caregiver or are you repeatedly caring? Now I'm going back to the, the theories um, because they are very valuable in this job satisfaction paper as well. So some of it might be now repetition, but maybe it's good to remind you. So um, now that we look at conflict theory, if we say conflict theory is the true one, then we would argue, OK, there is this conflict between caregiving and work and um, this causes stress. And um, then, of course, you have to stress and then appraisal theory actually says, OK, people try to blame one role for causing the stress. And it is argued that the work role is then the one that are is kind of blamed because it's the one that makes it so hard to combine the private sphere, the family sphere with the work sphere. And um, also the argument that I said earlier with fewer resources are available. Um, makes sense for job satisfaction as well. It's more difficult to be like fulfilled in your work role if you have less time available, if you have not enough mental resources, meaning energy or just space in your head, um, but also financial pressure. And here it is, uh, I think, very important to consider that having this work conflict means that you are figuring out, OK, um, I really need my job. I can't stop it because I really need the money because I also have to take care of someone that is sick that probably is not able to gain their own money. So it is really like putting this idea on the job that you have to have the job because you need the money. So it is really like changing also the perspective on the employment. And uh, what we saw before in my research that you that people need to adapt their work when they are having a conflict means also that the, the conditions of the job before are not fitting anymore. So there's always then this idea of, OK, um, my work is not fitting with my private sphere or my caregiving anymore. And um, in this research on the strategies of informal caregivers to adapt work, we also find that more people experience a work care conflict than can actually adapt their work. So there is really the struggle going on. And I think that can make you very unhappy in your job uh, if you have like working conditions that are not fitting your life anymore. And we argue that this mechanism is supposedly stronger the more you're involved in caregiving, meaning more conflict. That means higher intensity, the more hours you spend on, the more conflict you are experiencing and with a longer duration. And um, if you care once, it might be something you can okay, be OK figuring out. But if it's multiple times again and again, or um, you will have to issue that you really have to think, OK, all these arguments of before are getting stronger. So our hypothesis here is if we would say the role conflict theory is the one dominating, we would expect that job satisfaction will decrease uh, with higher levels of caregiving, meaning that you are less happy with your job when you start caregiving or even if you spend more time on the caregiving. But we also have arguments for enrichment really leading to higher job satisfaction. So first, there's, of course, this idea of this wider skill set that you're having. 
um, that you have time management and also personal growth. And um, this is related to job satisfaction in the sense that it gives you a feeling of achieving more and more efficiently. And I, I also saw that on Twitter there, but it was there about, um, about caregiving for children. And there were all the, the people were now like, okay, I don't have to be perfect in my job. I, I know I can manage my job by just putting in the 90% and it will be fine. And um, that can also make you more happy in your work if you feel more efficient. And I think we can translate that to the informal caregiving as well. And again, job can be really a respite or from caregiving. So especially when it's burdensome, what we know from research, it is very often. And I would also argue here that these are mechanisms are also stronger the more you are involved in caregiving. Again, there it would be more enrichment compared to before more conflict. Because more time spent on caregiving means more learning opportunities. And uh, if you just care for someone because they had an operation for two weeks, you might not learn that much about time management because you can take holidays or you can figure it out on the spot. And also longer caregiving means also you need a coping mechanism at some point. And this also, when you need it, you will figure it out. And sometimes it just needs time to adapt. And this is also something that the positive could be coming the more you have time to adapt. And um, if we now say, okay, enrichment is the convincing one and the only one going on, of course, it's always both conflict and enrichment. And that's uh, probably the, something I will conclude from our overall thesis. But if we would say it's the only one, we would expect that job satisfaction is increasing with higher levels of caregiving. So both when starting, but also when spending more time on the caregiving. Now I will go uh, into the more quantitative part of my uh, my talk and um, some of the PhD students here at Southampton were like oh no you will give like a completely quantitative talk but I'm trying to um, make it as comprehensive as possible for all of you um, what we did is we used UK data and it's called the household longitudinal study understanding society and we used multiple ways, meaning multiple time points from starting in 2009 to 2020. We decided to stop before the COVID pandemic because research shows that the COVID pandemic changed uh, caregiving, at least in the first lockdowns, a lot. So we decided to go before the pandemic. And we looked at people that were aged 16 to 65 that had at least two time points where they had job satisfaction measured, meaning two times points where they were employed. Because this is important because we look at changes. So only if you have two time points, you can really also see changes. And we excluded self-employed because they have very different job satisfaction. And um, also, yeah, it can be some strategy for caregivers to start self-employment. And we end up with over 31,000 respondents in over 171 observations, which means we have an average of 5.3 observations per person and 10 observations were the maximum and only few people had like really every were observed as employed in every time point. Analytically, we used fixed effect panel models which means that uh, in these models are stable characteristics automatically controlled for because we are looking at within changes. So it is basically, if you interpret it later, it is how is the, within one person, how did the job satisfaction change when you had the change towards caregiving? So it is really about uh, the changes because what you do is basically you take the personal mean of a person and subtract it. So everything that is stable, you, add, you subtract a mean and nothing stays. But if you have uh, subtract something from something that can change, only the change component stays. So maybe later when I explain how we coded our caregiving variable, it might be becoming even clearer, I hope. And um, also some technical stuff. Um, we also decided to go for a stepwise modeling. So we have two potential mediators, so explaining the relationship between caregiving 
and job satisfaction, which is working hours and job changes, um, because working hours and job changes could be due to having cared more, and then those might change the job satisfaction. But when we add them later or without them, both like the results for the caregiving stay the same. And when we add them, they have a better model fit. So we just keep them in and I will just give you the full model in the following. What we also did is we split the analysis uh, by sex and the location of caregiving. With the location of caregiving, I mean, if the caregiving wing was inside the household or outside the household, or if it was a mix, uh, if you had multiple people cared for, or if you had first um, caregiving inside and then the person moved outside or the other way around. Going a bit into our measurements. So the first, our outcome variables, job satisfaction was measured on a Likert scale from completely dissatisfied to completely satisfied on the question, all things considered, which numbers best describe how satisfied or dissatisfied you are with your present job overall. And if you want to see a distribution here, it's an example of the first wave. Um, but if we see it over all waves um, average, then it is, for me, it was very high uh, or had a really high feeling. So 5.3 is the the average means means that people are on average somewhat satisfied. And if you look at the median, most people are really saying, OK, they're mostly satisfied with their work. For the caregiving, we had this question on, is there anyone living with you who is sick, disabled or elderly whom you look after or give special help to? And the same question was also asked for outside the household. So we combined it and we have done the intensity measure um, with the cut point of 10 hours. If it was at least 10 hours, it was intensive care and nine hours or less were non-intensive care. But as I said before, we have to have a measure that is really looking into the changes more or um, we had this idea to model caregiving the following. Stay with me. So you have this example person here that in the first three time points didn't care and then started non-intensive care for two uh, time points and then stopped caregiving again and then started in the eighth time point intensive care and then reduced to non-intensive care. In our measurement on caregiving intensity, this would mean that the first three time points are coded as not started caregiving. And then we see a time period of that we code as starting non-intensive caregiving. And as you see, it spans over the stopping as well, which is why we really wanted to focus on this idea of um, transitions into this new role. So it is really about transition. So you don't really stop being a caregiver in our sense so that we can compare the part of not caregiving to the one that is caregiving. And the first time you experience an intensive care, you are then transitioning into intensive care. So it is really about the transition in each state. And um, for the duration, we did something similar. So the not starting caregiving yet is coded very similar. And the newly is the first caregiving moment we see in our data. And every subsequent um, caregiving experience is then repeated caregiving. So in a sense, if the fifth time point would also be um, non-caregiving, then it would stay the newly until the next, the second uh, caregiving episode is experienced. So it is again here about the, these transitions from being a newly caregiving, having the first time the experience and then having a second time. We also controlled for time varying variables because the non-time varying ones are automatically controlled for anyway. So we controlled for age and age square. Age is also important to model time in our models. We included if the person had a partner or not. Uh, we included the youngest child responsible for and then really going into the age categories. We also included having a permanent job, yes, no. And uh, for me, it was something very important. I thought you will be way happier if you start having a permanent job. Uh, I, I remember that Jane was like not very convinced by it. And now that I see the results, I'm also not that convinced anymore uh, because it doesn't help. So sadly enough, uh, maybe my academic kind of idea that you would be happy with a permanent job, uh, I don't see that in our data. So. 
sadly, it doesn't make you happy to have a change from a non-permanent to a permanent job. Maybe it's hope for everyone. And then we also included some, some of job changes. We had to do the sum because then we see every time you have a change in the job as a new change in the models. So it, yeah. And we also included the working hours. Some descriptives. And um, so we have this over 31,000 respondents. And if we want to look at our ASH comparables really from this respondent level, um, we would say see that 68% of the respondents never provided care throughout the complete period. And 20% have non-intensive caregiving, at least. Um, and 12% experience intensive caregiving. Uh, if we translate that also to the duration, we see the same never provided care throughout the whole period with 68% and newly care, only newly care, so they, we only see care for them once, is 13% and 9% have repeated caregiving. But as I now repeatedly say, it is about changes. We also have to see if there are changes going on. And there are a lot of changes going on in the job satisfaction. If we look at two subsequent time points, we see that 42% are stable, so they have the same job satisfaction. And 31% have negative changes, so they are less happy in the next time we uh, observe them. And 27% experience a positive change, so they are more happy uh, in a subsequent moment. If we look at caregiving duration, we see way less um, changes going on. So only in all, all races averaged, we see only in 3% of the um, subsequent waves, we see that people started non-intensive caregiving and 2% they started intensive caregiving. If we look at duration, it's a bit higher, but it is a bit due to how we model or how we coded the caregiving. Of course, everyone that is newly will be very quickly repeated. So that's why there is more changes going on that we see in 4% of the subsequent waves, a change of starting newly care and 4% started repeated care. And now we go into the multiple regression models and now comes juicy stuff now. And um, stay with me for those that did, uh, are not that quantitative. Um, I blotted here the marginal effect at the mean, which basically I want to show what would be the predicted values um, of an average person. And um, just to show you how the difference look, could look like. But what you see already is that the scale is not from one to seven, which is the scale of the job satisfaction, but we really have to zoom in to see differences. So they are quite small. And the first difference that we see is that not having provided care um, is significantly different to provided non-intensive care. So if you have started non-intensive care, your job satisfaction is lower. We also see a difference between non-intensive care and intensive care. So um, it is higher your job satisfaction if you do intensive care compared to non-intensive care. And we don't see a difference between having not cared and having cared intensively. And if you want to give you a, a bit of input on how big these differences are, so we have a scale from one to seven, and the differences are 0 0.05. So it's quite low, but it's also within changes that are in general quite low. So between changes are, of course, between two groups, it's always bigger than within one person. So we see something going on there, but it's very little. Um, we see also something going on if we look at our caregiving duration. Here we see that not having provided care and repeated care is significantly different. And also newly care is different to repeatedly care. And there's a less certain kind of uh, difference between not having cared and newly cared. Here we have a p-value of 0 0.06. So what I find quite nice is that you here see what you would expect by conflict theory, that you have the highest job satisfaction when you didn't care. And if you started care, you were, experienced lower job satisfaction and even lower job satisfaction if you cared repeatedly. 
giving them also some numbers, uh, we see that there is like a reduction of 0 0.05 um, from newly care to repeated care, 0 0.07 from not having care to repeated care, and 0 0.03 would be from not provided care to newly care. But it is with less certainty. When we split our analysis, we see that mostly women and were driving our results. Um, so both for intensity and duration. And we also see that even this, this what I just said, this slightly significant one is then with higher certainty going on for women. If we split for location, we find that outside the household is also driving our results. So for intensity, it was both outside the household or a mix between inside and household. And our results are replicated for the ones for duration for only those outside the household. So there might be something going on, but uh, in the limitations, I will tell you that this might not be the perfect way to really figure out if those are driving our results, but it gives us a bit of a nuance because our, I mean, our main goal was to see, is there a job changes when you start caregiving? And here we have some nuance, what is driving our results. We did also some robustness checks. There was the category varying below 20 hours for the caregiving. And um, we put it into low set intensity caregiving because we wanted to have at least 10. So we wanted to be sure to know that it was at least 10 hours per week. Um, so in a robustness check, we excluded those. It had this um, category. We included a stopping category. So a last kind of change possible. And um, in the last change we saw where they stopped caregiving. And we also split the analysis for early uh, working age and late working age to, uh, because we decided to look at the complete life course and we're not sure if that was the right decision, but none of this uh, changed our results. I remember that day I was like, did I do something wrong? But I checked, uh, they seem to be really robust our, uh, our results, which is quite nice. Um, I will give you some limitation before I will conclude. Um, so one limitation is, of course, again, and uh, probably it's a limitation of my complete dissertation. Of course, if you want to look at employment consequences, you have to look at the ones employed. And one, of course, research, but also what I find is that you stop working or retire earlier. So there is a survival bias. People that are Staying in the employment are different people than the ones are dropping out. Um, we didn't test for any mechanisms, so we don't know if the conflict is now really the one going on. Um, and job satisfaction is kind of in the question, not 100% clear what is driving the lower scores or higher scores on a job satisfaction. Are you less satisfied with your job because your condition changed? your job conditions or is it because okay I'm caring for now for someone and I absolutely don't care about my work anymore so it is always not that clear what is going on with this measure. We are completely limited by our observation window. I mean having panel data of over 10 years of so many people is really a big advantage but especially our coding of our caregiving variables is influenced by this observation window because we have these transitions and there might be a transition happening before our observation window that we couldn't include. So uh, what this means is that we might underestimate our results, meaning um, there could be more going on, more caregiving, and maybe then also more negative effects of caregiving. And what I said already before, that splitting the analysis gives us a nice hint on what could be going on, but it is not really a clear formal test because the difference could be also due to lower sample sizes. Uh, I can also tell you that, uh, yeah, most, yeah, our caregivers are mostly women and the caregiving is mostly outside the household. So also more changes are going on there, which is in itself, of course, also a result. And now I'm concluding. So what we see is there's some more conflict going on. And so we see some evidence that there's a negative uh, effect of starting caregiving towards um, job satisfaction and especially non-intensive caregiving and repeatedly caregiving. But we have also some null effects and uh, effects might 
sizes are quite small. So we argue that there, the story is more complex and it's likely both enrichment and conflict going on with a little bit of conflict dominating. So the policy advice would be also to stay, keep trying to avoid conflict, of course, but there should be also ideas going on on how enhancing enrichment can also help caregivers. So I wouldn't say we should give up on the enrichment idea. I will stay finding it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the idea is to keep yeah, pushing for more enrichment and less conflict. And now I'm really looking forward to all your comments and questions because you will help us to develop this further. And um, yeah, if you have um, any additional questions or comments we are not covering now, just email me or anyone like Maria or Jane. Uh, we are happy to receive further comments and questions, of course. Thank you.